the question came to mind, why Jesus? Why would God send His only Son why, for a wretched sinner like me, why would He give up His Son? And, and, and I went through that logic and I, I, whew, it's hard to understand, isn't it? And then my eyes rested on these scriptures I want to read to you this morning. And I think there's good reason for God giving this Son. And we just have to examine this scripture to find it. And I hope we can do that this morning. If you will, stand with me. Psalms 103. And we're going to begin in verse 6. It says here, The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Verse 10 through 14. He hath not dealt with us after our, our sins nor rewarded us concerning, I'm sorry, rewarding us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear Him. For he knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we are dust. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to come out and worship you this morning. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your son. And what was accomplished on Calvary. Dear Lord, we praise you and we thank you for that great gift. Dear Lord, as we go into this holiday season of Christmas this year, help us never to forget the debt. So that we can value the gift more sincerely. Dear Lord, just forgive us all our sins. In your name I pray. Amen. Starting in verse 6, we see uh, this first attribute. I knew I was going to get tongue-tied. This first attribute of, G of God. And it says, The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment... For all that are oppressed. And, and I begin to uh, think about this verse and the justice of God and how God is just. I, I believe we could go through the Bible and find many, many, many verses that speak to God being a just God and a fair God and one that executeth judgment. And, and, and so we can go and we can find that. But what does that really have to do with Christmas? God's... Uh, if you will, go with me to Amos 7 and we're going to get there. We're going to talk about Christmas a little bit, I promise. But I want to show you a few things about God's justice. In Amos 7, in verse 7, it says, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And what God's telling Amos there is he's, he's, that pass by them, he means I won't spare them anymore. And, and here's the line, and if they cross it, judgment's coming. It's what he's telling uh, Amos here in this prophecy. The plumb line, in my mind, uh, represents God's righteousness. In which all else is compared to. And the holiness, His holiness, God's holiness, makes Him the plumb line in which all is able to be compared to. When we want to know what sin is, we go back to God. And if it's not godly, if it's not His righteousness, it's sin. And so all else is compared to God and to that plumb line. There is no greater judge than God because God knows what it looks like to be perfect. If, if we go and, and we build, and we've done this here recently, Brother Joe and several, Brother Larry, we have to have a starting point. We have to have a level. We have to have a corner post of some sort. 
so that everything else lines up. And that's God. That's why and that's what makes him the perfect judge and shows perfect justice is because he is the straight and narrow. He is the almighty. He is the holy of holies. He is the plumb line that we go back to. There is no greater judge than God. For us, this is invaluable. What I mean by that is, see, if God... God's goodness is the plumb line. Everyone else is not. What I mean by that is we're in the same boat. We are both and all of us in here born sinners. I'm not going to get to heaven because I'm better than you. And you're not going to get to heaven because you're better than me. <laughs> God holds the plumb line. Not another human being. He defines right and wrong. And His holiness supersedes all mankind's opinions. Also, God knows when little old me is faced with a bad decision. And as I seek Him, He's going to seek justice and righteousness for my life. So He's going to, as the psalmist said in Psalms 23, He's going to lead me in paths of righteousness. That's invaluable. As I seek Him, I know He's going to take me down the right path. He's not going to lead me astray because He is righteousness and He is justice. He cannot and will not overlook sin. If God overlooked sin, what kind of God would He be? Imagine this, if, if God overlooked sin and, and I went out and I did something to another person, something really, really bad to another person. And God just simply said, Oh, Trey, he just doesn't know any better. Imagine God to that victim. That victim would look at God as, as if he doesn't demand worship. He, doesn't, he isn't honorable enough to worship because he looked over Trey's sin. You see that? But yet, there's angels that fly around God day and night. And they cry, holy, holy, holy. He is just and He is righteous. And He can't overlook sin because that would taint His holiness and His righteousness. He is just and the penalty of sin must be paid. To meet justice, the sin... Sin penalty must be paid. But paid by who? Because I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. We've already established that. He's the plumb line. He is righteousness. He is justice. So who can pay this thing? What is the penalty of sins? Romans 3.23 For the wages of sin is death. But I can't do anything to take away that penalty of sin upon my life by myself. But God yet demands sin to be paid for. The price is sinless blood and I ain't got none. <laughs> Just for a reminder this morning, how many of us have ever started the Christmas story with the justice of God? If there were no price to be paid for sin, there would be no Christmas. We need to remember the debt as we talk about the gift to see the, the value of the gift. It's huge. This gift that God gave to us is invaluable because it paid the debt on my life and on yours that we could not pay. But skip down to verse 10 and verse 11. I want to show you the mercy of God for a minute. Verse 10 and 11, it says this, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. So great is His mercy. You see, God is, is just, God is mercy, God is love, God is so many qualities. And if He ever ceases to be those qualities, He ceases to be God. 
And so God's mercy can't supersede His justice. It can't overweigh His justice. They have to work together. But, Jesus, but here in Psalms 103, in verse 10, it says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. That doesn't sound like justice. When you do something wrong, you have to pay for that wrong, right? That's justice. See, God shows His mercy too. He shows justice on one hand and mercy on the other. God is all these things and the Bible declares He is and He can't just stop being any of them. He will be just and He will be mercy, merciful at the same time. We ended talking about justice just a moment ago with the thought the sin price must be paid for. This is where mercy comes into the picture. See, God showed His mercy by not giving me something I deserved. And what He didn't give me was death because that's what I deserve. His justice demanded a payment that I could not pay. So God, through His Son Jesus, stepped down and paid it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's what He did. And that's His mercy. It's on display for all of us. He sent His Son to be the sacrifice for sins. Romans 6.23 It says, For all... I'm sorry. 6.23 <laughs> For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see it? That's His mercy. The wages of sin is death and He paid it through His Son, Jesus. So His justice and His mercy, they, working, they work side by side to accomplish God's will. I want to show you something in Hebrew. Something you may have... Uh, one of those scriptures that we don't talk about a lot. But man, it's there and I hate to overlook it this morning. In the book of Hebrews... Chapter 5... I'm going to look at verse 8 and 9. For finding fault. Sorry, that's the wrong chapter 2. Chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Though we were a son, yet learned, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them. That obey him. He learned obedience. As I began to study that word. And, and to think about what that word really means. One of the definitions that came up is he understood it. He understood it. <laughs> Jesus didn't just understand obedience. He mastered obedience. He mastered it. He, even to the point of His death. Philippians 2.8 talks about He humbled Himself in obedience even to the point of death. That's my Jesus. When I couldn't understand obedience, when I couldn't master obedience, Jesus could. And He came and He did it for me. Oh, the mercy of God. 2 Corinthians goes a step further in explaining this. 2 Corinthians chap chapter 5. And verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of of God in Him. It's only through Jesus Christ can we see the righteousness of God. Because of our sin-tainted life, the justice demanded a penalty be paid, but mercy stepped down and paid that penalty. I love a song uh, it's been sang here before, My Story, uh, by a guy named Big Daddy Weave. <laughs> It's funny saying that name in a sermon. Um, 
But he says this lyric, justice was served and mercy won. That's how they work hand in hand. Justice was served and mercy won. Just imagine this, if, if you walked into a store that I own, and you came and you charged an item, uh, we would write you up a bill and have you sign it, and within so many days you would have to pay that bill off. Now if you came in and you paid that bill within the time frame given to you, nothing else could be said about that debt. The debt would no longer exist. But in Psalms 103, look at verse 12. And as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. You can go north to a point that you begin to go south, but you can never go east to a point you begin to go west. You just continue to go east. There is no point. The east is from the west. God takes our sins and He casts them off and He sees them no more. Just like that debt that you paid in full, Jesus came and He paid our debt in full. And God no longer can look on me as I put my faith in Christ. God can no longer look on me without seeing His Son. And my sin debt's paid. That's why Jesus... God's character demanded Jesus. No other way could He show mercy and justice at the same time. But also I want to show you verse 13 and 14. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear Him. For He knoweth our frame, He remembereth that we are dust. Two examples right here of how God is personal. He's like a father. God is called father many times in the Bible. And it speaks of his relationship and the relationship he wants to have with us. But he knows about me also in very great detail. In Psalms 103 it says he knows my frame. That means my height, my my stature, he knows uh, that I'm fragile. What does it say? It says he knows that we are dust. He knows how fragile we are. And he knows that we're not going to be here forever. Verse 15, as for man, his days are as a grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes for a short time. And that's why he pities us. He knows how fragile and how incomplete we are without Him. In Luke 12, verse 6, probably a scripture that you've heard many times. Luke 12 and 6, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for a farling? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not therefore. Ye are, more, ye are of more value than many sparrows. He knows how many hairs I have on my head. For some of you, that may not be a lot. He may not have had to count much. But I got a thick head. And he knows every hair. He knows my frame. He knows my stature. How valuable am I to God? I'll tell you how valuable we are to God. So valuable that he sent his only son to die on the cross for us. And he wants to be so personal with us. John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father. There's that word Father again. But by me. You see, without Jesus, 
God could be as personal as He wanted to be towards us, but we could never know Him. Because that sin debt's still there. But through Jesus, we have access to the Father. Now, I can have a personal relationship with Him. He knows how valuable He sees me. He knows everybody in this room this morning. But unless we're willing to accept His Son, Jesus, as the complete gift that paid our price, we'll never know Him. Why Jesus? Because He's our only hope for this life. He's our only hope in life. John 10.10, 10, Jesus declares, I came to give life. I came to give life. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been faced with the reality of sin this morning. You know that there's a pen, sin penalty upon your life. Jesus took care of that penalty on the cross. And if you're here this morning wondering what you could do about it, let me tell you, this Christmas you could rejoice more than any Christmas before because you would know the true gift of Christmas. He can do that. He's willing to do that. As we get prepared for a hymn of invitation, I want to ask you this this morning. Why Jesus? I think every person in this room at some point in their life, as they look at salvation, have to answer that for themselves. Why Jesus? And as a seven-year-old boy at church camp, I came to the re realization that why Jesus? Because he was the only one that could save me. He was the only way. He was the only truth. And let me tell you, He was the only way to my Father God who desired a personal relationship with me. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, that's the true gift of Christmas. And He wants you to know Him this morning. As we sing, I want you to respond to that. I want you to come know the King of kings and Lord of lords. And, and to know and have fellowship with the one who is holy and righteous and just and merciful. Because as we go through our days, we need mercy and grace. And He's the one to provide it. Amen. Come know Jesus this morning.